Okay, thanks so much for the kind introduction. Um, as Barbara said, I am a partner of uh, Studio The Green Isle, uh, which is based in Berlin and New York. Um, and many of the projects you'll see um, have been created in a variety of collaboration and constellations um, with the team. I have worked as a designer with technology for a long time. And to be honest, I have a love-hate relationship to it. On one hand, I'm constantly amazed by the things it can enable designers to do. At the same time, I'm curious about the role of the designer in a technology-driven world. I hope some of these projects will speak to this. Designing with code. I've always been excited by the possibilities of technology to impact design, and I find the tools that we are all using are constraining us. Why is it on a software maker to define how we can use type or color or gradients? And conversely, what can we do with code that we're not able to do otherwise? These are some early experiments with algorithmic typography, exploring what is possible with a stroke-based typeface, where every letter, stroke, and point can be interacted with. I designed the logo for the Azure Aero Earth project and brought it to life using interaction on their website. We use the gesture of slicing to create the dynamic identity for the design studio Midnight Commercial. We designed a brand for an exhibition about the Rubik's Cube using a 3D version of the cube, which resulted in the typeface Rubik uh, that you can find on Google Fonts. And we designed an algorithmic visual identity for the MIT Media Lab that resulted in 45,000 individual logos, one for each student, faculty, and staff member. I love the web and what it affords, and I love to question and break the systems that make it run. I'm very inspired by all the work that Yuan just showed us. Last year, we helped MIT Architecture to celebrate the 150th anniversary. It is the longest running architecture school in the country, and the inspiration was all about the archive and the collection. We used archival imagery on their website um, to slice through their history in this layered tunnel um, traveling through time and space. And we used that metaphor of layering of documents um, for uh, the web experience and also all the print design. Previously, we were asked to design the branding of an event for um, Columbia University, uh, specifically the Center for Spatial Research. Um, and the conference was about cities, urban planning, architecture, data, and technology. The conference was called Ways of Knowing Cities. We asked the list of international speakers to give us the GPS location of one place in the world each. The whole identity relied on the idea that our knowledge of cities will always be limited and you will always only be able to see a slice of it. So as you scroll through the website, you see glimpses of that location, but you'll never see the whole place. This also translated into the posters and all the conference graphics. This is a collaboration with Mozilla for their office spaces. <clears throat> One of the things that Mozilla does, of course, is to make the Firefox browser, and they're also proponents and um, champions of open web standards. So our first idea was, um, can you create something where you literally step into a web browser? <clears throat> we were thinking, can we use the browser uh, and websites as our palette? So we figured maybe we can take many browser windows um, on the same website and scroll it there just right. Can we then actually create typography with it? We really like this idea, but we figured we can go beyond this. I'm still amazed by the notion of what a browser actually is. For any given website, you can look under the hood and see how it's built, and every website you build will expose how it's built to others. So with this project, we wanted to celebrate that.
Um, the installation uses four displays. Um, the first one just shows a stream of websites, always real time, always from the day. As it scrolls up, um, uh, the HTML elements for each are highlighted. These are then remixed into this collage on the right side. When you look at the collage, you'll be able to tell if you're on the New York Times, Wired or The Guardian. You're able to identify their visual identity, typography and the design of each of the websites. And it indiscriminately shows what is currently shown on the web, um, whatever is the headline of the day. And of course, sometimes it turns into a Mozilla logo. We've created a variety of these type of entrance situations or signs as Barbara called them in our conversation before this. This is at the Jewish Museum in Berlin. Um, and it was an exhibition about food and different food cultures around the world in different traditions. In one section, we created an experience that is around dietary regulation. In this case, the Leviticus rule which is about that you are not supposed to eat any flying or creeping things. So we created interactive buzzing typography made out of uh, creeping and flying things. When creating interactive pieces, we often feel very restricted. They rely heavily on technology, are expensive. Often only one person can interact at any given time. Often the interactivity itself feels limited and it's almost non-existent. So at some point we were wondering what happens if you create an interactive experience in the simplest, cheapest possible form for as many people as possible. So this is what we came up with. This is a large white wall that is just made out of stickers in a grid. People can leave a white dot by taking out one of the stickers. And with that, you can play with the grid. You can leave a mark, you can uh, leave a symbol, you can leave an image. Um, this is at Ars Electronica. It's a media festival in Austria. We won an honorary mention there, even though this does not use any electronica at all. And as you can see, um, people are leaving their mark. Uh, and since these are stickers, they actually have to go somewhere else afterwards. So they go to the wall to the left, they go onto the floor, they go onto other people, they go on other artwork, uh, and they make it out into the city. One of our um, most favorite stories is our friend was at the festival in Austria, visiting from London. After the festival, he flew back to um, London and at Heathrow Airport, he found one of the orange stickers. At a later point in time, I went back to the same idea. <clears throat> I had the opportunity at Google to create an entrance in installation, um, and I figured we can create a digital, more permanent version of this. So instead of stickers, we used arcade buttons, 5,000 of them. This is the first prototype where you can see um, that you can press the buttons and they can light up in RGB colors. And here is the first prototype working. Um, and this is the first RGB test, just trying it out. Um, this is at the entrance of the Google building here in New York. So, and it is actually open to the public. So were it not for COVID-19, you could go here and play with it yourself. It is first and foremost a sign um, so at the entrance, it will display Google. And just like the Google Doodle on the Google homepage, it is not just one logo, but it um, displays Google in many different designs, animated. And since it's an interactive display, of course, these are buttons, you can interact with them. Um, so one of the rules we had was that any button press will create something and will influence the logo in different ways. Uh, and while this is a very large display, it at the same time is a very low resolution display. Nonetheless, um, I think it has the most inputs. Um, for example, an iPad only allows for 10 maximum finger inputs. Um, another thing that I'm really excited about with this project is that we open sourced everything about it. So 
The thing that runs it are web apps running an HTML canvas. Um, the software is for people to use and the whole hardware schematic is shared as well and people are reinterpreting it. Um, both people within Google and outside and Google also has used it multiple times in multiple locations already. This is a project for the new Bauhaus Museum in Weimar. Last year, the Bauhaus celebrated um, its 100th anniversary. <clears throat> the exhibition museum is looking at Bauhaus in a historical context and how much it keeps relevancy today. For this, we looked at the Manifesto by Martin Gropius. The Manifesto was written as a publication to draw people to the Bauhaus to study there. Of course, it functions as a vision document, but it really also was a great piece of advertising and PR. Um, we picked certain sentences from the manifesto and designed a custom display to show it. The building is designed by Heike Hanada and has many multi-story spaces, so you can actually see and look into different spaces from many different locations. The design of our sign had to accommodate for that. So we created this custom display that on one hand has a deep black background. On the other hand, it's light and transparent and can be viewed from multiple angles and sides. We developed a custom variable typeface together with Elias Hanser, and before creating it, created a virtual simulator to experiment with how the typeface um, in its variable thicknesses would work across the display, and we built a variety of physical prototypes. The piece exists as a welcome sign for viewers when entering the space, but it also interrogates the original Bauhaus manifesto. It interrogates the relevance of the Bauhaus uh, today, and also just the notion of writing manifestos in the first place. Some of the pieces I showed so far exist in public or public-ish places, but we rarely get to work in actual public-facing fa spaces. Um, this is another project with Mozilla, um, and they asked us to create something for this window at their office in San Francisco. The window is literally at the heart of Silicon Valley. Um, it's at the Embarcadero in San Francisco, across the street from this window. Um, people are waiting in line to get onto their bus for their various companies like Google and Facebook. Mozilla already had a poster sitting behind this window. So they asked us, what if we create a digital poster? Um, the window obviously has these very um, pronounced mullions and is very defined by the grid. So instead of fighting the grid, we figured we might work with this grid and we came up with this idea of a triangular pixel. And again, building many, many prototypes um, with projection, um, with displays, and we created these, this layer, this mask that sits on, in front of an LED displays with um, uh, custom light chambers. So each triangle can be really light up individually like a pixel. And this is the design phase, working with the triangular pixel and what is possible with it. And together with Hubert Fischer, we developed the typeface specifically for this triangular grid and for this window and the window dimensions. And since it is a grid, you can scale the typeface um, in three scales across the window. And this was one of the first Photoshop mockups for this project. And then this is the final thing. Um, here's some details of it. As you can see, the grid actually is not only triangular, but also slightly three-dimensional and has depth to it. And this is the piece in and of itself. And this is interesting to me just because Mozilla um, occupies this interesting space in the technology world today. Of course, they're a te technology provider creating uh, the Firefox browser, but they are also a voice um, uh, questioning what is what the technology world is doing uh, in terms of data ethics and privacy. And this piece has become 
in a way, a way to broadcast and um, express these messages right at the heart of San Francisco. This is uh, another project, um, uh, I would call it interrogating technology. It's a self-initiated project we did at um, the iBeam um, space in New York, and it was about um, machine learning data sets. And we kind of discovered these this is a couple of years back, and we were interested in this idea. What is in a machine learning data set? What kind of images are these? What kind of images are in the data sets? What are the images that are not included in these data sets? So for example, this is a data set by MIT, 64 um, uh, uh, graveyards, uh, 64 bedrooms, and you can see how these look like and maybe also how they don't look like. And we're also interested in um, the aesthetics of these because these images really are not made for humans to look at. They are made for computers to look at, and that is expressed in how the images are created. And um, we created a variety of products around this, but one of them was inspired by this idea of um, finding an objective truth in the form of uh, data and machine learning. And we were inspired by the movie Blow Up, um, where he constantly tries to find the truth at the uh, by constantly zooming in and by early computer graphics and fractals. So what we created was this large poster um, that was created using software and it functions like a mosaic. So from a distance you see a face as you get closer, it breaks up into um, many smaller images which are from these data sets. And as you keep moving closer, it again breaks up into uh, one more set of um, images. At this point, you see three and a half million images. This was generated using um, a printing process that's used to create um, uh, uh, circuit boards for electronics. And the last project I will show um, was um, created last year. It was together with HumanScale, the furniture maker. Um, they wanted to create some, something for the Milan Furniture Fair. Um, and they had access to this tunnel, which is under the main train station in Milan. For this, we went back to one of the original designers uh, that uh, worked for Human Scale, and they created a book that actually was called Human Scale. And it was really a pioneering design publication around ergonomics. And we are very interested in this aesthetic. And the task by Human Scale in the brief was all around celebrating human bodies in motion. And we took this graphic and abstracted it into one of their core elements, which are these. 15 dots that define the human body. And in cognitive science, there is this, this idea around in motion, you can actually identify a human body just by seeing enough points while moving. And that was our core idea, really starting from a piece of graphic design. And this is how we imagine bringing this into the physical space. Uh, using light. Um, here again, we work with a lot of codes driving. These are robotically controlled lights um, that can focus a very narrow beam and we create an experience where you, with your body, And here's the final video about this. Thank you.